mention then that there was an area I wanted to deal with, but I would teach a separate lesson altogether on that. That's what we're going to do tonight. So if you would turn with me to the book of Proverbs chapter 2. Good to see Brother Glenn back. Glad that he's doing well. And, um, very, very good to have my mom here. And uh, I wish I had half of her constitution. I'm telling you, she's she's a strong woman, and she just keeps going. She really does. She amazes me. Survived two kinds of cancer and uh, a number of other situations. But she's she's still going forward, and I'm thankful for that. Proverbs chapter two. Now I'm going to tell you this is not going to be a comfortable subject. Um. going to have to walk carefully, but it's something that has to be addressed. And so I'm going to do my best to use wisdom and discretion and yet be plain enough get the point across so if there was ever a time that we needed the instruction I'm going to give it's in this hour Proverbs chapter 2 and we're going to start with verse number 6 Proverbs chapter 2 and verse 6, for the Lord giveth wisdom. Out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. He layeth up sound wisdom for the righteous. He is a buckler to them that walk uprightly. He keepeth the paths of judgment and preserveth the way of his saints. Now, 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 now listen to me. The wise man is telling us that this is what God will do for us. He, he'll preserve our ways. But you know how he preserves our ways? He preserves our ways by giving us instruction on how to walk. So we can't expect him to preserve our ways if our ways are not pleasing to the Lord. But if we'll follow after what his word tells us, then we've got a promise of preservation. Verse 9, Then shalt thou understand righteousness and judgment and equity, yea, every good path. Just confirms what I'm saying to you. When wisdom entereth into thine heart and knowledge is pleasant unto thy soul, discretion shall preserve thee understanding shall keep thee to deliver thee from the way of the evil man from the man that speaketh froward things who leave the paths of uprightness to walk in the ways of darkness who rejoice to do evil and delight in the frowardness of the wicked whose ways are crooked and they froward in their paths to deliver thee from the strange woman, even from the stranger which flattereth with her words, which forsaketh the guide of her youth, and forgetteth the covenant of her God. For her house inclineth unto death, and her paths unto the dead. None that go unto her return again. 
neither take they hold of the paths of life. Now, this obviously sounds extremely final. And if you just look at it superficially, it almost sounds hopeless. But thank God for the blood. The blood of Calvary, which Solomon did not have access to. There is still hope. Nevertheless, the warnings that he issued ought to be warnings to which we take great heed. Because he's, he's telling us this is extremely important. He doesn't, he doesn't go into anything else with the, with the gravity that he addresses this subject. He talks about a lot of things. But, but, but as, as you are most likely aware throughout the book of Proverbs, he'll touch on something and then he'll move on to something else and he'll touch on something and he'll move on. But when he gets on this subject, he's letting us know we really need to pay attention. This is serious business. Praise God. And so tonight I'm going to begin a lesson on guarding against immorality. Guarding against immorality. I don't expect folks to run the aisles during these lessons. But I do pray that somehow I can convey tonight the importance of the things that I'm going to try to instill in you. And it's something every one of us need to hear. From the young people to the older folks. Praise God. And so tonight, if you would, let's put our Bibles down. Let's lift our hands and lift our voices and let's ask the Lord to help us tonight. Pray. Jesus name could we just worship him together right now everybody let's praise the Lord together I love you Jesus I love you Jesus praise God praise God praise God amen 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 God bless you you may be seated I want to I want to start out tonight making a statement. I hear people say all the time, well, sin is sin. All sin is the same. I'm going to tell you that's not the case. Now, it doesn't matter what the sin is. Sin can keep you from going to heaven. If you don't get it dealt with. 
sin will affect your relationship with God. But not all sins are equal. In fact, I'm not going to get into it tonight, but I will tell you that there are some sins that are categorized as abominations unto God, and that's not every sin. Right. But those sins are extremely wicked in the eyes of God. In fact, the very word abomination carries a connotation that it is so evil. That if God were a human, it would make him sick to his stomach. That's what the word abomination means. And that's why it, it, it pays us. And we will at some point go through the abominations that are listed in the Bible. We're going to deal with that before this series of studies is over. But it, 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 would, it would behoove you. To make a study of the scriptures that identify the things that are an abomination to God. Right. Now, now be careful because some things God told the Jews, this shall be an abomination to you. All right. But he didn't say it was an abomination to him. Right. And then the Bible talks about something that was an abomination to the Egyptians. So don't get confused and just strictly find the word abomination, but make sure when you find it that it's talking about what is abominable in God's sight. Amen. And then those are things that we ought to avoid at every cost. But the sin that we're going to be talking about tonight, I'm here to tell you it fits into a special category all its own. This is worse than just another sin. Brother Hilton, read for me Proverbs chapter 6, verses 32 and 33. And I'm going to show you where I said a while ago that Solomon many times will deal with things and then he'll just move on, deal with things and move on. But when he gets to this subject, he always does what he can to stress the significance of this. Proverbs chapter 6 verses 32 and 33 says this. But whoso committeth adultery with a woman lacketh understanding. He that doeth it destroyeth his own he soul. He destroys his own soul. A wound and dishonor shall he get and his reproach shall not be wiped away. A wound and dishonor shall he get, and his reproach shall not be wiped away. Now, that's not the case for every sin. But it is the case for this sin. Now, I do want to tell you, it doesn't mean that this sin cannot be forgiven. It doesn't say the sin will never be wiped away. It says the reproach. Solomon is telling us that when a, when, a, when a person gets involved in immorality, especially in this case with someone else's spouse, there is a reproach that will go with them the rest of their life. You can be forgiven and thank God for that. Thank God for that. It is not the unpardonable sin. But I am telling you that there is a wound, and, and that word wound, I looked it up in the original, it, 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 it basically speaks of a mark such as one left by leprosy. There is a wound that comes. And dishonor, and, and that word means shame and disgrace. 
And then he says his reproach is going to follow him to his grave. Now, now church, listen, I'm telling you, I know that this is 2023, almost 2024. And I understand that this is not the mindset of today's society. But it is the mindset of God. And that mindset doesn't change. God wants us to know this is not something for us to take lightly. This is not something for us to play around with. This is not a spirit that we can entertain for even a moment. You hear me tonight. This spirit will destroy you yes, sir. if you don't get control of it. Right. Right. Oh, yes. Yes, yes. It will destroy you if you don't get control of it. And it will destroy a church. And, and, and listen, and, and I'll, I'll get into this more as I get deeper into the lesson. I'm just going to throw this out there because it comes to mind and comes to heart right now. I want you to understand, and I, I, want, I want our young people to listen. I want everybody listening to me for what I've got to say tonight. And again, I'm not expecting you to shout and run the aisles, but, but I'm telling you, I feel this so strongly tonight. I want you to know that when you get involved in immorality, you open the door to the church for that spirit to flood the pews. Come on, Pastor. It's right. Yeah, it's true. I've watched it happen time and time again over the years. This is not just something you can go do and then then go find you a closet and say, God, I'm sorry, and then it's all over with. I'm telling you there's a spirit involved, and it's a vile spirit, and it's a destructive spirit. And it's just as destructive if you never touch another individual physically, but you're looking at it in pornography. It's just as destructive. And you're still opening the door for a spirit to come into the church. And you need to understand, before you ever get involved in this, you need to understand you're putting the whole church at risk. Now, you might be able to go out somewhere, tell a little quote-unquote white lie, which I don't believe even exists, but in your mind, you might be able to do that and repent and, and then go on and everything's fine. But I'm telling you, it won't work that way when it comes to immorality. As a church, we've got to have a collective front. That we are all battling together, not just for our sakes, but for the life of the very church itself. That this is one thing we will not entertain and we will not tolerate. Through the years, I I have been more harsh in dealing with this than anything else but I believe it's because the Bible is more harsh and when I've dealt with folks most of the time the first time and maybe the second time I do it privately but when I see that they are not getting the message there have been times I've had them stand up in front of the entire church 
and confess and repent. Because I want them to understand this is not just you. You're damaging the body of Christ. There is a lasting reproach that cannot be removed. And the pain and the, the devastation and the grief and the shame that's associated with this go far beyond the heart of the person who commits this sin. Yes. Right. We're going to get into it. I'm going to prove everything that I'm saying to you. I worry about this going out over the internet, but I guess it's too late now and we've got folks at home sick and folks traveling and they need to hear it too. I'll talk more about the far-reaching effects as we get deeper into this lesson. But let me just remind you what we read in our text in Proverbs chapter 2, verses 18 and 19. Listen to what the Bible says. For her house inclineth unto death, and her paths unto the dead. Her, her house is inclining to death. It's leading you to death. And her paths unto the dead. None that go unto her return again. Neither take they hold of the paths of life. I'm telling you, no one ever fully recovers from this devastation. Please hear me. Again, I'm not saying you can't be forgiven. But what I am telling you is they will never be the same person they once were. They just won't. There will be something that happens to them that they cannot shake off the rest of their life. Yes. There will be shame, even if it's never found out. They'll live with it. I know whereof I speak. I've dealt with people through the years. I know what I'm talking about. Now again, I don't want to make this sound like it is so final you can't be forgiven. Please, please don't read that into my message. But I am telling you that there is a degree of shame that you just will never get away from. Proverbs chapter 7 verses 5 through 27. It's a lengthy reading so why don't you open your Bibles and follow along. Proverbs 7, verses 5 through 27. Listen to what the wise man said. That they may keep thee from the strange woman, from the stranger which flattereth with her words. For at the window of my house I looked through my casement, and beheld among the simple ones I discerned among the youths a young man void of understanding, passing through the street near her corner, and he went the way to her house, in the twilight, in the evening, in the black and dark night. And behold, there met him a woman with the attire of an harlot and, and subtle of heart. She is loud and stubborn, her feet abide not in her house. Now is she without, now in the streets, and lieth in wait at every corner. So she caught him and kissed him, and with an impudent face said unto him, I have peace offerings with me. This day have I paved, paid my vows. Therefore came I forth to meet thee, diligently to seek thy face, and I have found thee. I have decked my bed with coverings of tapestry, with carved works, with fine linen of Egypt. I have perfumed my bed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. Come, let us take our fill of love until the morning. Let us solace ourselves with loves. For the good man is not at home, he has gone a long journey. He hath taken a bag of money with him, and will come home at the day appointed. With her much fair speech, she caused him to yield. With the flattering of her lips, she forced him. He goeth after her straightway, as an ox goeth to the slaughter, or as a fool to the correction of the stocks. 
Till a dart strike through his till liver. Till a dart strike through his liver. As a bird hasteth to the snare. Read. And knoweth not that it is for his life. Hearken unto me now therefore, O ye Hearken children. Hearken to me. And attend to the words attend of my mouth. Attend to the words of my mouth. Let not thine heart decline to, to her ways. Go not astray to her paths. For she hath cast down many wounded. Yea, many strong men have been slain by her. Her house is the way to hell. Her house is the way to hell. Going down to the chambers. Going down to the chambers of death. When I looked up this, this last verse, another translation for this word chambers is the darkest vaults. And the way death is used here, the, the idea is ruin. And so once again, we are, we are pulling out the Riggin revised version, and here's what I come up with. Her house is the way to hell, going down to the darkest vaults of ruin. Again, I tell you that if a spirit of immorality ever makes an inroad into a church, the far-reaching effects of that spirit can literally shut down that assembly. Many years ago, and I know this is going out over the internet, uh, so I... I hesitate to name the denomination but um, a very well-known denomination that at one point had the word Pentecostal in their name I was told I was told that they were ready to accept the oneness Jesus name message as a denomination they were dealing with a prominent apostolic leader and he was convincing them of the truth until it was discovered that he was in immorality and when they learned that, they shut the door on this message. To this day, if you ask one of the old timers who still looks Pentecostal, if they are Pentecostal, I've actually had them get angry with me. They don't want to be associated with Pentecost. Because one man fell into sin. And so I'm telling you, church, that's why I've got to be so strong. Look, we've been given these great promises of revival. And I believe God's going to keep every promise he's made. But, but don't think for a minute that the enemy is not going to do everything he can do to try to shut the doors of this church. And I want to tell you, he understands that one of the ways he could do that is if he could get this church to give in to a spirit of immorality. And that's one reason I have fought it and fought it and fought it through the years. From the time that I became pastor here, I, I'm telling you, it is one spirit I have had zero tolerance for. Because I understand it will stop our revival. We've got to fight that spirit with everything we have if we intend to win. And look, the only way a church 
can conquer that spirit is if the individual saints conquer the spirit in their own lives. Spirits can't just come in and take over a church. Individuals have to give in. And when the individual gives in, then the spirits made an inroad into the church. And so the answer is, every one of us have got to establish safeguards in our life that we're not going there. I might have some problems in my life, but I'm not going to let that be one of them. And those who will not conquer that spirit ultimately will lose out with God. And so what I want to do, look, it'd be easy. It would be easy for some of you to say, well, it would never happen to me. It would never happen to my family. And that's exactly what the devil wants you to believe. Because the minute you think it could never happen, you let your guard down. And if your guard is down, I promise you, he will come after you. In the area where you are not protected. He'll do it. Well, praise God. Now, now, let me, let me just make a few statements to our young people tonight. Now, Friday night, you get to have youth service, and it'll all be fine and dandy, and you can swing from the chandeliers. But tonight... Pastor is going to be pastor. And look, I, I want to tell you something. We established a long time ago that, that around here, dating is not recreational. You don't just go on a date to have fun. It's got to be for the purpose of courtship. In other words, you are looking at this person as a potential spouse. And if they're not going to be a good spouse, they don't need to be your date. Now having said that, let me just throw this out. Young men, if you can't support a wife... Forget about dating or courting right now. Oh, it's so quiet tonight. Just forget it. Get it out of your mind. Until you get to a place that you can support them. Because that's your obligation. The Bible still says that a man should provide for those of his household. That's in the Bible. That may be old-fashioned, but that's in the Bible. And so it's your responsibility to take care of her. And if you can't do that, then you don't need to take her out. You don't need to even think about taking her out. Go drink a soda with your buddies and forget about girls for now until you get your act together and reach a point that you can provide. Why do I say that? I'm going to tell you why. Because the heart is a funny thing. And I'm telling you just what starts out just, to, well, we're just friends. We're just friends. Uh-huh. I have yet to ever see a young man and a young lady maintain a friendship where at least one of them did not get emotionally involved. It happens every time.
So you need to keep your friends among your own gender. And there are only two of those. Just throwing that in free of charge since it's going out over the internet. If they're going to find fault with me, let them just find fault with everything. Now let me talk to the young ladies. Ooh, did you notice how quiet it just got? <laughs> young ladies, if you can't keep your room clean, show other signs of responsibility around the house, You know, a lot of nights I have voice problems. I'm not having any problem with my voice tonight. I think you can hear me loud and clear. You need to learn how to cook and clean. And the fact of the matter is, in today's society, you may very well have to get a job as well. In fact, when there's no children at home to take care of, it's probably good for you to be involved in something to keep your mind occupied. I'm not saying you have to, but... Sure wouldn't hurt anything. And let me, so let me just say this. Let, let me say this. I shouldn't have to say it, but I'm going to say it. But young people, one of the worst things you can do is decide you, quote unquote, like somebody before you come talk to your pastor about it. The minute you think you're interested, we need to have a conversation. Because if not, you can allow yourself to get so wrapped up in that other individual. And then, if the pastor has to put his foot down, and I've had to do it before. I've had to step in and say, I don't feel good about this relationship. And once, once emotions are involved, it's extremely painful. To make that separation. Much, much easier when you first notice that little flutter in her eye. Or you see those bulging biceps of his. Whatever it is that attracts you, I'm telling you before you ever entertain the thought that I'm interested, you ought to have a conversation with your pastor. Not because I want to be a dictator. Not because I want to be a micromanager, but because I want to spare you heartache down the road. And there may be things about that individual that you don't know. <sighs> and so I've seen it way too many times. Young person's emotions gets involved before they seek spiritual input and then their heart is broken. Or they just choose to disobey. And then the heartache is even worse. Now I don't I'm not I don't have time tonight to go through dating guidelines. We do have guidelines. 
We've got a whole list of dating guidelines and responsibilities. Again, not because I want to be a micromanager, but because I'm trying to protect you. These are fences that are put there for your safeguard. And I'm going to tell you, 100% of the young people who have followed the guidelines have kept themselves pure. And 100% of those who have broken the guidelines have not. These are not just random choices to make your life miserable. They are safety nets to help you stay happy. And, and look, you know, I, I've, through the years, I mean, believe it or not, I know it was a long time ago. I know it was when dinosaurs roamed the earth. But once upon a time, I really was a young person in a church. And I know how many times I would hear some young person say, I wish people quit thinking we're a couple. I wish people would quit thinking we're a couple. Well, I want to say this. If you don't want people to think you're a couple, then don't be meeting up and hanging out. That seems simple enough. Well, we're not dating. Well, maybe you need to go read the dating guidelines again and find out exactly what we consider a date. Because I think my definition of date and your definition of date is not necessarily the same thing. Ooh, it's getting tight in here. I'm trying to help you. But again, I say to you, if you can't marry them, you don't need to go out with them. If you don't have a copy of the guidelines, you can come see me or see Brother Hilton. I think Brother Hilton's got a copy that he can get for you. He's our youth leader, so um, if you don't want to come talk to the mean, the mean pastor, then, then go talk to the sweet youth leader. He'll give you the exact same guidelines I'm going to give you. But parents, let me say this. Ultimately, you are the ones who are responsible for the enforcement of these guidelines. Well, I'll tell you, I, I, last night, I was going through some files, and I came across a message by Elder Westberg. And I had never heard it, and I thought, well, I'm going to listen to this. So I listened to Elder Westberg. He actually talked about Olathe when he was, and he was preaching up in Hood River, Oregon. But... Uh, this, this was before I ever came here, but, but he, was just, he made mention of it anyhow. Another story for another day. But, but, but he was talking about how they were having a problem with some of their young people. And, and he said, I'll tell you how I fixed it. You just have to know Brother Westberg. I said I want every young person. I think he said age seven and up. And their parents to meet with me after church. And he said, parents, I'm tired of having to deal with this. And so I'm going to tell you what we're doing. He said, from now on, if I've got to address this problem in your child, I'm setting you down. He said, we never had another problem. Maybe I need to be more like Bishop Westberg. Right? 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 That's what he used to do. That's <laughs> you just have to know Bishop Westberg. He's a one of a kind. Hallelujah. I loved him. He loved me. 
He was a great man. Misunderstood man, but a great man. But parents, you're the ones that are ultimately responsible for the enforcement of these guidelines, and you need to have a meeting with your children or your young person or whatever and make sure that these guidelines are enforced. All right, so having gotten all of that out of the way and only having 20 minutes left, why don't I get into the lesson itself here tonight? <laughs> the good news is I won't have to go back over that when I review. There's some of that that we've gotten it out of the way and we won't have to come back to it. But uh, there are some things that I want to give you tonight I, because this whole lesson is about helping you. It's not about condemning you. It's about helping you. Because there is a danger out there. And you need to be aware of it. And you need to know how to deal with it. So I'm going to give you some scriptural principles of protection. Scriptural principles of protection. Um... Number one, and this is really simple. This is really simple. Number one, love God. You need to develop a deep, thorough, lasting love for Jesus Christ. Mark 12 and 30, read. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength, this is the first commandment. This is the first commandment. Love God with all your heart. Because God is able to keep you if you'll just fall in love with him. Jude 1.24 says this, now unto him that is able to keep you He's from falling. He's able to keep you from falling. And to present you faultless. He's able to present you faultless. For the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. I'm telling you, God has that ability. But what's going to do it is falling in love with Jesus. That's what it's going to take. Not just living this way but falling in love with him yes. what kept Joseph in his time of temptation let's read Genesis chapter 39 verses 7 through 9 and it came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast, his, cast her eyes upon Joseph and she said lie with me but he refused and said unto his master's wife, Behold, my, my master wotteth not what is with me in the house, and he hath committed all that he hath to my hand. There is none greater in this house than I, neither hath he kept back anything from me but thee, because thou art his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against and God? And sin against God. Yes. Do you understand this is a young man? If I can say it just bluntly, with all of his hormones raging, he is far from a home. Nobody knows him. Nobody knows what his standards are supposed to be. He's living among the Egyptians. And no, he didn't have the Holy Ghost. That's right. And yet in a moment of extreme temptation, he said, I can't do it because I can't sin against God. He didn't say, if I do this, I might end up in prison. 
He didn't say if I do this, I might get caught. He said, I can't sin against God. I'm telling you what kept Joseph in the moment of temptation was his love for God. And, and listen to me, listen to me. If you'll fall in love with Jesus Christ, then when temptation comes your way, you're going to have the same attitude. I can't sin against God. I love him too much. Yes. Oh, yes. Hallelujah. The old song says, I love him too much. Yes. To fail him now. Unfortunately, the person that wrote that song didn't love him enough to keep from failing. That's just a fact. Failed in the worst way. But the song is true nonetheless. Or it ought to be true. It ought to be more than just the words of a song as it evidently was for him. Right. We've got to fall in love with our master. Yes, sir. And that love will keep us in a time of temptation. So that's principle number one. Very simple. Very simple. Just love God. Yes. Number two. Use the word. How many times have you heard me tell you this, church? There's power in the word of God. Yes, sir. This is why you need to be reading your Bible. By the way, to our M&M class, this is a good time for me to remind you that if you're planning on being an M&M next year, you got to finish reading your Bible this year. So you still got a month. Might want to get busy. Might want to play it at double speed or something. Make sure you get it done. Yes, sir. Use the word. Psalm 119, verse 11, the psalmist said this. Thy word have I hid, thy in, word my have I hid in my heart. Why? That I might not, that sin, I against might thee. not sin against thee. Yes. We need to bury our faces in the word of God. There are scriptures that we ought to commit to memory. If you're struggling with some weakness in your life, there are scriptures you ought to commit to memory. Yes, sir. Or at the very least, write the reference in the front of your Bible or write it somewhere. Or put it on your phone where you can look it up. Have it where you can get to it when you need it. Scriptures like 1 Chronicles 4.10. And Jabez called on the God of Israel, saying, Oh, that thou wouldest bless me indeed. Oh, we and, like that part, but, but let's keep and reading. Enlarge my coast, and that thine hand might yeah, be yeah, with me. Yeah, we like all of that, but, but keep reading. And that thou wouldest keep and me from evil. And that thou wouldest keep me from evil. That it may not grieve me. And God granted him that which he requested. Yeah, you know, years ago, somebody got rich talking about the prayer of Jabez. And they focused on this whole bless me and enlarge my coast. Yeah. But I'm going to tell you there's another part to this that we cannot overlook. And that is God, I want you to keep me from evil. Right. Keep me from evil. And God granted that which he requested. Yes. God, keep me from evil. Hallelujah. Oh, I feel this so strong tonight. Hallelujah. That ought to be a regular prayer. God, keep me from evil. Hallelujah. 
Matthew 6, 13 says it another way. And lead us not into lead temptation. Lead us not into temptation. But deliver, but deliver us, from, us evil. from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And, and we could go on. There are so many other scriptures. We've, we, we've already read Proverbs 2. I won't go read that again. But, but there are many others that you could read uh, from Proverbs 2. We could go 16 through 20. Actually, you, you could Proverbs 5, verses 1 through 23. Proverbs 6. 6, verses 24 to 35, Proverbs 7, verses 5 to 27, uh, Proverbs 9, verses 13 to 18, Proverbs 22, 14, Proverbs 23, verses 26 to 28, Proverbs 30, 20. Is that enough? Now, I, I know I read those off too fast for you to get them all written down, but it's all recorded and you can go and, and listen to the message again and put it on pause and write the verses down. But these are some things you need to use to keep you from sin, especially this one. You need to remember 1 Corinthians 10, 13. I dealt with this when I dealt with temptation. The lesson on temptation, I dealt with this. But let me just, let me just hit it again. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation, temptation also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. All right, so first of all, look, remember this. You're not alone in this struggle. You're not the only person battling this. In fact, can I tell you as a pastor who has pastored now for almost 40 years that I've found that when one person in the church is battling a particular kind of spirit, usually several are battling the same thing. The fact of the matter is you may think you're alone in what you're going through right now, but you're probably not. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is what? It's what? It's common. And know that God has promised he will make a way to escape. First Peter 5, 9. Whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. The same afflictions. Everybody has the same problem. Same problems. Everybody has the same problems. Somewhere out there, somebody else struggles with what you're struggling with. Now, it happens to the saved and the unsaved. But there's a difference. We've got a helper. We've got a helper. The world doesn't, but we do. They're going to have the same struggles, the same problems, but you've got somebody to help you that they don't have. Understand, this is a trial that comes to everybody. I'm telling you, I'm telling you at some point in most people's lives, they are either going to be tried in the areas of doctrine or finances or integrity. And a lot of times it'll be all three. Maybe not at the same time. But most people through the course of their life are going to face at least one and perhaps all of these temptations. It just happens. And that may sound frightening to think, well, I've never been tempted in that area, and so here I am telling you, it's very possible that temptation could come. You say, well, that's frightening. Well, I want to tell you something. Blessed is the man who has a healthy fear. He does far better than someone who is brazen. 
and thinks they don't have to worry. Now this is not only common, but it's temporary. Psalm 23 verse 4 says this. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. I just want to point this out. He said, though I walk through. I walk through. Not into to stay, but I'm going through this. Understand, if you'll just pray, if you'll love God, if you'll do the things that your pastor's trying to tell you to do, then you will go through this temptation as well. Hallelujah. And, and one more thing you need to remember. You need to remember that trials, that trials are allowed in your life for the purpose of making you wiser, making you stronger, making you better equipped to help someone else. God doesn't allow these things to punish you. He sends them for your benefit. Job 23 verse 10. But he knoweth the way that I take. When he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. When he's tried me, I'm going to come forth as gold. He's purifying. He's refining me. Oh, I've got to hurry here. So, rule number one, love God. Number two, use the word. Number three, stay busy for God. Read for me 2 Samuel, chapter 11, verse 1. And it came to pass after the year was expired, at the time when kings go at forth... At the time battle, when kings go forth to battle... That David sent Joab. David sent Joab. And his servants with him, and all Israel. And they destroyed the children of Ammon and besieged... Can we get Reba. this verse on the wall? Um, this is 2 Samuel 11, verse 1. There we go. Thank you. But David tarried still at Jerusalem. But David tarried at Jerusalem. Now, does anybody have any idea what happens in 2 Samuel chapter 11? This is where David commits sin with Bathsheba. Do you know when he committed sin? At a time when he should have been in the midst of the battle. It was wartime, but David decided to take it easy. And it's while David was not occupied doing what he needed to do for the kingdom that he fell into sin. And as you know, that sin led him far deeper than just the sin with Bathsheba. He ended up having a man put to death to try to cover it up. But it all happened at a time when David should have been busy. And he just wasn't. Saints of God, look, let me just throw this out there. But when, when I tell you we're fighting devils, it's, it's easy for some of you to think, well, I'm not fighting any right now. And so you just kick back and take it easy. But you need to hear me. If the rest of the church is fighting, you need to be fighting. You may not have a personal struggle going on, but you need to understand your brothers and sisters need you in battle right now. And you need to fight just as hard as if it was your personal struggle. Because if they're all fighting and you're not, guess who the enemy is coming after? Don't let yourself become isolated and feel like you're not a part. Understand you're a part of this body. You're a part of this church. And you've got an obligation to fight the devil. Whether you're feeling it personally or not. 
Listen, that's a, another reason why when we come in for pre-service prayer, you can't just take it lightly. You got to walk into every service saying, hey, we're fighting the devil tonight. They say, well, I'm doing good. I've got the victory. Great. Then help some others fight. Yes, come on. Don't take it easy just because you don't have a battle right now. When you're the one battling, you're going to hope somebody's there to help you fight. Number four, that's 859. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to stop right there. I've got, I've got a couple more that I'm going to give you in the next lesson. But... Um, I'm not going to try to go into it tonight. It's, it, I've just got, I've got more to deal with here. And, and so, um, I'm going to leave it at that. Musicians come. We'll, we'll pick up with number four next time. Now again, I, I know this is not a, a kind of lesson that you're going to be shouting over and but I do hope that you're taking it to heart and this is one of those lessons church that if I could implore you and I I hate listening to myself I really do I don't like going back and listening to myself at all and I normally would not ask you to do something that I don't want to do but in this case I am asking you to go to the website and download this lesson and each subsequent part to this lesson and keep it. And when the battle comes, go back and listen to it again. This is just practical stuff. But it's essential stuff. It's necessary stuff. Because I'm telling you, I want every one of you to go to heaven with me. I want to take everybody under the sound of my voice. I want us to rejoice together on the other side. I don't want there to be anybody missing when we get over there. And I sure don't want anybody to have fallen by the wayside because they were overcome with immorality.